Hello everyone and welcome back to the stream. This is the Animation Exchange Day 3 and we are here with the one and only Amanda Renfro, the co-head of animation at Steamroller Studios. Let's hear in the chat. Take it away, Amanda. Excellent. Thank you very much. Hello everyone. Thank you for coming to my talk. This is Embracing Failure in Animation, a topic about leadership. And uh, I'm just going to ask you guys to bear with me a little bit here because I had been practicing this talk and the more and more I kept kind of hearing myself just read this document got a little boring. So I'm going to wing it a little bit, but you're going to see me look back here. So just bear with me and enjoy the ride. And uh, I do want to start this off with just giving a big shout out to Anim State team for hosting this talk and making this all happen online keeping us connected and giving us a place to talk about what's going on in the industry and what we've kind of learned in the past year. So thank you, thank you, because it has been one hell of a year this year, but collaborating has been stronger than ever. And I do believe that there will be a day where I get to meet all of you guys in person. So who is this Amanda Renfro? Uh, well, I am co-head of the animation department here at Steamroller Studios in Central Florida, and it is my role to help grow and better the animation department at Steamroller. A little bit of what my job entails is pushing growth, challenging quality, bringing in awesome projects, supporting leadership, and most importantly, nurturing the health of the department. And this video on this slide is actually from my first year at Steamroller in 2014 when I was brought on as a production coordinator and I was transi transitioning into an animator position. I felt like this video was a fair representation for this talk because it is a very small chunk, a small chunk of videos in which I had failed to say my line correctly. I fail a lot, guys. And some of those moments are caught on camera. But every time I failed, I always got back up and I would try again. There was also the person behind that camera that encouraged me to always... I'm sorry, this slide is not changing. There we go. Uh, there was always some... There was the person behind the camera that would also support me in getting back up. And I have been fortunate to have a great mentor throughout my career thus far, and that, that person being Jalil Sadul. I've been working with Jalil for just about seven years now, seven years in July, and he has really mentored and shaped a lot of the ways that I look and apply philosophies, my leadership ideals, and how I carry myself. So he's also thank you, Jill, has introduced me to a lot of other awesome leaders that are in our industry as well. Mike, Christian, Simon, uh, if you guys are watching, just saying, hey. But uh, I've worked with these guys on various levels with Jalil on some projects, and it's really been insightful to see how they manage their teams and run their projects. So, you know, what I'm sharing with all of you guys today is nothing that reinvents the wheel. It's nothing that gives away the secret ingredient to the steamroller sauce. I am here to share what is hopefully some helpful insight with the more common leadership mistakes that we have made and that I have made and what we've learned from them. So I want to share a story with all of you and it's an embarrassing one for me, but hopefully it's going to show you a little bit more about who I am and the team that I work with. So this had happened not super long ago. We had gotten a project from Universal Theme Park for a new park attraction. And it was my role in that, pro er, in that estimate to give the time and the cost for the animation for, for the new attractions. Now, this scope was gigantic. And... We're going into about round three with Universal. It's about six, seven o'clock on a Tuesday. I had just wrapped up the latest edits and then I sent them out to George. 
And George, George is our directors of technologies here at C. Miller Studios. He handles a lot around here. Uh, but in this particular situation, he was the one who was gathering all of this information, putting it in that spreadsheet, and sending it out to our client, our partners over at Universal. <sighs> so, do you guys know that moment in Home Alone 2 where Kevin's mom just passes? Kevin's luggage over to her husband and she says, Kevin's not here. Kevin's not here. He's not here. We, we forgot him again. That was this moment for me. I had forgot to fill in a box. This box was estimated at a potential $2 million. It was a potential $2 million I had forgot to put in the spreadsheet that went to George last night. My heart sank. I'm sweating. I'm stressing. I just made a huge mistake. I lunged out of bed. I ran to Slack. And I had to tell George now. George. Uh... Did you send out that that spreadsheet that to, to Universal last night? Of course I knew this answer, but I had to ask. <sighs> Why, yes, we did. In fact, they're really liking that new cost estimate that we spent over to them, so things are looking great. Shit. George, I had forgotten to fill in a box in that spreadsheet that had cost a potential uh, $2 million. Now, I couldn't see George because I'm talking to him through Slack right now. And uh, but I'm sure I'm just positive the blood completely had left his body and his long, lovely hair, black hair, just completely went gray and fell out. But OK. All right. I need to go talk to Jalil. I slack Jalil. We hop into a Zoom call immediately and he sees me stressing. He sees me freaking out. And then he calms me down. And he starts to immediately start working on, how are we going to move forward? Throughout this entire situation, not in any moment did my team look at me as if I just made a, a huge mistake. The mentality was more on, you know, how do we solve the problem? They had my back 100%. This could have been so much worse if at any point we had sat on this situation any longer. Because there is a long chain of command that this stuff takes, uh, has to go through in order to get approved. Now, if our partner had approved of this estimate, we would have to consider taking, taking this project at a $2 million cost. Now, luckily, that did not happen and everything worked out and we are A-OK. -okay. But it is moments like this that show how united our team is. We have each other's back 100%. We know each other's value here at the studio. If one makes a mistake, the other is there to pick it right back up. The owners themselves make mistakes and they don't point the finger at other people. No, they pick each other up. And that same mentality has seeped down to all of us. All of the heads of, of Steamroller Studios have that same philosophy. Now. When we're having a nice evening and we're sharing a dram and whiskey club, which, by the way, is happening right now. Cheers. Uh, we can have a good laugh at these these moments. You know, we can relax a little bit, sh shed off the stress. We quickly move on from these mistakes. We grow from these mistakes. And in a way, we grow a stronger mutual respect for each other in these difficult situations. That's a team working together with no ego. So let's talk about teams. And I want to share some of my experiences working on Anthem at Bio, with BioWare at Steamroller Studios. So our team structure looked a little something like this. We had the animation director slash supervisor who was all about quality control. They were there to support the team to make sure they hit our internally or internally internal quality bar as well as our partners. 
they're also part of the bigger conversations that has anything to do with the uh, bigger creative decisions that need to be made. Then there is the animator animation lead, which was myself at the time. Uh, that person is very much like the headquarters of the project. They know the ins, they know the outs uh, for the internal team and for the project and for our partners. Then there's the production coordinator who is very much like the communication and tracking hub that supports and manages information for, for and from everyone on the project. Then there's the pipeline team. They are there to support the tools and unblock any major issues that pop up along the way. And then there are the animators themselves. So we were about halfway through this project and my production coordinator, Susie, at the time, she had brought me into, into a room to have a private conversation. And she sat me down and she looked at me and she said, I'm concerned that your stress and your straight to the point attitude is closing you off from the team and pushing everyone away. She said it much nicer than that, but uh, she was calling me out. She was making me aware of the ne negative effect my attitude was having. It was, that day was amazing. Like I could not have had more re respect for her because she was bringing that negative, like that just straight gun, straight, oh my gosh, straight to the point attitude here. And my team was feeling like they couldn't talk to me because I was so laser focused on the client and the project that I had failed to see what I was doing to my own team. When she told me that I was sucking the energy out of them, that just smacked me in the face because I, myself as a leader, I need to be able to take a step back analyze and fix the problem you have to watch yourself and surround yourself with people that know you that will be open and honest with you you don't want to be surrounded by people that only just say yes at steamroller we are bringing people here that speak their mind and don't hesitate to correct us when we're going off course or when we're wrong as a unit we work together to keep on course and have these discussions when we are having issues. At the time when working on Anthem, we were very much still a small team. We were accustomed to having a lead working with a supervisor alongside a coordinator. We were learning on the project that my responsibilities were becoming more and more like a project lead. So I was seeing a hole in leadership and I realized that I needed support. So that's when we decided to bring a second lead onto the project in which we call support leads. Now, my focus was being client facing and taking care of overarching needs of the project. That left me dropping the ball with my team, with my animators, whenever they were having an issue. Bringing another person in on the leadership team who's been productive on the project was what we needed at Steamroller. As, as you are in the project and you are figuring out how the cogs all move, you start to organically figure out the pieces that, that you're missing or that can be improved. And at that point, we had found out that after having a certain amount of animators on the team, we needed that person on the leadership team to help the individual animators while the main lead was dealing more with client and project-related concerns or issues. So. Now that we're talking about building support onto a team, I want to touch on the subject of delegation. Because like everyone talks about delegation, and that's because delegating is important. And you have to make a very conscious effort to delegate. Uh, so on my first project as project lead, you had I had this natural instinct where I was like, uh, I kind of want to I need I want to do everything myself. But I also wanted to grow myself as a leader. And it could have been a big mistake if I had stuck to that mentality of being like, I need to do everything myself. No. Because in that moment, I understood that I needed to understand the art and learn how to truly delegate. The moment I did that, it unlocked the entire project. Susie, 
who was the production coordinator, now not only had one person, but two people to go to for needs and questions and tasks. While uh, it allowed me to not also have to worry about the nitty gritty stuff all the time, because now I now had my support lead, in which was supporting me on all of the troubleshooting or keeping the animators or keeping an eye on mental health. I was able to focus on the whole project with the animation director, all while the animators would stay on task and remain unblocked. Now, it is only in hindsight can I actually say this more with confidence, because if I had gone with my instinct and being like, yes, I want to do everything myself, oh, could have been a train wreck. But I was also very lucky to have the right people around me. So I had made the, I made the choice not to do everything. We had found support to help out the leadership team. And Michelle, hey Michelle, uh, was on the team who was doing extremely well. And I made the decision to bring her on as my support. So we can't talk about delegating without talking about teaching. Including people into the teaching process and not being, you know, stressed to be overly prepared to teach it. Know that the journey is way more important. Sometimes when you're preparing a teaching moment, you want to be as prepared as possible. You work on this beautiful presentation and then you pass it along to your team. But Sometimes it can actually be more difficult for them to understand because it's so overly prepared that they're only seeing the end result. They're only seeing like the, the bottom line. So, you know, when you do that, you're only showcasing the end result. What makes us a better teacher show is, is showing someone how you problem solve through all the snags and all the obstacles and why you came to that conclusion. The best way to teach something is to allow you to go on the journey together. Show all of your weaknesses. When you run into a breaking point or something doesn't quite go as planned as you had hoped, demonstrate how you had troubleshoot to fix it. Anthem had animations plus uh, some ties to the exporting process, but when we moved on to Destruction All-Stars with Lucid Games, that was increased by tenfold. We were a part of emotes and gameplay and cinematics. We were much more involved on the creative side of things. And so I, as a lead, uh, I, I was overwhelmed. I was like, okay, so I need to learn all of this. And then I need to teach all of this. And, you know, Jalil would always say that it is better to learn from the process than it is from the solution itself. So what I decided to do was to bring the people in with me to learn together. Instead of me learning everything and then passing it along, I gave them much more room for them to grow on the project with me. For this next point, you're going to be seeing my face here a little bit because I just feel like this is more of a face-to-face -face conversation. And I want to talk about hiring because it's important in who you bring into your team so being a part of the hiring process is just a big responsibility to have because your goal is to find the right person that fits the team the projects and to spot if you know their goals or or their dreams align in some sort of manner with the company's philosophies or the vision because then you're going to know that they're going to be happy working with you so we invest a lot of time in our hiring process, and we recognize that the time that we're putting in, the person that we're talking to is also putting in their time. And we have definitely made some mistakes and some discoveries <laughs> along the way in our hiring process, and it's taken us some time to finally get to a spot where now we're feeling confident with the people that we're bringing into our team. I'm going to share with you guys what some of those mistakes were, along with some mistakes that we have seen in interviews that have not necessarily been appreciated. Let me tell you guys. We chose to hire someone more based on personality. 
Now you're probably looking at me like, oh, are you kidding me? Who hires more based off of personality? Well, let me tell you guys. We, we were in a place where we felt like they could grow. And growth is a big part of our philosophy. We, we made the mistake here, though, of realizing that this person was too far behind. And it started to hurt production. So we don't give up after trying multiple times to get this person to fit in with our production pipeline. And I hate using this wordage, but I'm going to say it. We had to let this person go. So sometimes you have to ask yourself, how much quality in animation are you willing to give up for personality? We tend to be 50-50 because we believe in growth. We believe that if that person has a uh, great personality and they are not quite fully there with their animation, but they're strong in their body mechanics, we can get them there. So this is what kind of led us into creating a test. Now, there's a big talk out there whether tests are needed. We completely understand why animators with really good demo reels say, why do I need to be tested? It's my work right there. Unfortunately for us as employers, a big part of this is efficiency. So we've realized that a lot of these demo reels have had a lot of supervision on them. And if that animator was to do that same shot on their reel by themselves, it would have taken them a lot longer to get there. Some animators we know have gotten notes daily from their supervisor. And, oh, nope, I lost my spot. <laughs> to that point on their demo reel. So let me just say that, yes, it is their work on the demo reel, but it is a represent. I'm stumbling here. Now you guys see a little bit of, the, of me trying to wing too much. Uh, yes, it is their work, but you have to ask yourself, is it a complete representation of their work? No. This is where we've made the biggest mistakes because the demo reel is a representation of the final work. When it comes to the hiring process, demo reels have been the biggest pitfall. You look at a really good demo reel and you say, oh, yes, let's hire that person. But the process for us is way more important. So now keep in mind that we do understand that this is your work and the artist is proud of their work. But for us as employers, we not only have to worry about the finished product, we have to worry about the process and the efficiency in which you got there. For us, we do want animators to be able to get there on their own. And a lot of the times, you have these shots that are, you know, have been over supervised on, on their demo reel, where that supervisor has looked over it, they've done the drawlovers, they've given the feedback just about every day, which is great. But are these animators efficient and are they able to get there on their own? And a lot of the times we have learned that this answer is, is no. So since we've made a few of these mistakes, we saw the need to create a test. Now for us, we do everything from body mechanics, locomotion, cartoony, uh, performance heavy. We just do just about any type of animation. But we decided to cater our test to body mechanics because we felt that if you understand the phys physics of animation and body mechanics, it's much easier for us to train you in understanding the acting by shooting reference and helping you with staging, composition, and continuity than the other way around. If you're really good at performance and acting, but your body mechanics is off, we realize it is much more difficult to get you to a level that fits in with our production. 
Now, you may totally disagree with this, but it actually works better for us if your body mechanics is stronger and we give you the support on your performances. If you have animation that is clean and your body mechanics is strong, you will get the training with us. Because guess what? We have so many diff different types of projects. We're going to start you off on a body mechanic heavy project. We're going to train you on the performance side. And as you're getting better and better, we'll, we'll move you on to a performance heavy project. Now, with that all being said, that's just the animation side of things. We also have all of the smaller details that we're looking at as well during this process. You know, does, does the person follow the guidelines of the test? How is their communication through email? Are they submitting the checkpoints in on time? Did they apply the notes that was given by our animation team? And you know, halfway through the test, if we have a supervisor available, then that supervisor will give a round of notes to that person testing. This step is just fantastic to include because if you have the resources for it, it's going to show you how that person takes feedback. So all of this combined gives us an idea of who this person is and what it might actually be like to work with them before we even ask them to interview with us. But hey, let's say you've done the test. We like your test. We like your work. Come and interview with us. And let me tell you guys, we have a clear goal with our interviews. When you're done with the test, you've made it to this point, it means we already like your work. So we actually want to hear more about you. This is an interview. We're going to ask you interviewee questions, and we ask them for a reason. We really want to know about the mistakes you have made as a human being. We want to know about the mistakes you've made in your career rather than your successes. Hearing all about your mistakes has shown us how you have grown from them. We're going to ask you questions that you may hesitate to share. But, you know, answering our question of, have you ever knocked heads with a supervisor? How did you handle it? How is your relationship with that person now? We're going to ask you about your flaws and give us a flaw that shows you as a human being and, and how you've gotten out of it or maybe how are, what are you doing to improve it? It is way more important for us to understand who you are as a person. Sometimes when someone comes in and it's all rosy, it feels fake. You know, we acknowledge that no one is perfect. When you come in all rosy, it, it, it just doesn't allow us to get to know the real you. When you come to us, we want to know that real person. We want to know you as a human being. We like your work. We don't need to hear about the career path. Tell us what you do outside of work. You know, how do you treat others? It helps us to know how you are going to work with us. So, all right, here's a fun one. So I'd like to share a mistake that I have made being the interviewer in an interview that I now have to be very conscious about moving forward. Let me tell you guys, there is such a thing as getting too excited in an interview. I let this energy show so much that this person had came back with an enormously high rate that, uh, you know, they knew how much we wanted them. I had made that super obvious. And it is embarrassing to have to go to that person and be like, I am so sorry. This is a bit embarrassing and kind of insulting, but uh, what we can offer you can't even match what you're asking for. So be excited, but you have to know how to manage it. All right. Let's talk about mistakes that we have seen in some of our interviews. And this interview still fairly blows my mind a little bit because this person was fairly rude, overconfident, and it had us looking at each other like, seriously, is this, 
Is this happening right now? It was shocking for that person to not realize that we were looking more at their personality than their work, that they were being rude because they took this interview as, ugh, this is just an interview. You have me, you want me. Just to show you that we put equal value on your work and your personality, that person's work was so amazing that before we had even talked to them, we were like, yeah, I'm going to hire that person. But then halfway through that interview, we weren't going to based solely on their character. They weren't, they weren't going to fit in with our team. That ego was so big. Where do you fit it? So it's unfortunate because that, that person, their work would have been some of the best work we would have had at this studio. But the thing is, is that they're going to create a hole for themselves in this industry. It's a small industry. But if you put a dollar in a jar when you heard someone say that, someone would be very, very rich. Uh, but you know why people say it's a small industry? Because I bet you that that person knows someone that has burned a bridge. Everyone talks to everyone. Word spreads. Please respect everyone that you interview with, whether it is in this industry or outside of this industry. Answer the questions honestly and respectfully. Do not mock the interview process. All right, here's another one. Someone being late. We're just tardiness in general. There is no tardiness at the studio. We do not appreciate it. We do not tolerate it. There have been people that have been five, ten minutes late. <sighs> Jalil does not wait five minutes for an interview. No, okay, he is gone. He is out. Okay, don't be late. Communicate if something pops up. Things happen. We get that. They totally happen. And communicate it. And do your best to not be late. When you come into an interview with us, go in there with humility. And show your willingness to learn. We can read through a person's words when their emotions or their motivations aren't matching. Don't fake it till you make it. Don't be a bullshitter. You're, if you're just faking it just to get a job somewhere, you're hurting yourself and the people around you at the studio. So. Have everyone's ears in leadership, making these decisions and having everyone's voice heard is incredibly important. We like to think of ourselves very much like the Starship Enterprise, where everyone gets a seat at the table. Everyone gets to say what they, what they have to say. And then there is a decision that is made, but it's a very collected decision. Usually, when a decision is made, Maybe it's not everyone being 100% happy and, you know, there's a little bit of a compromise there, but we all need to be in alignment. And let me tell you guys, we have never had an argument where someone has been unhappy with the decision made by leadership. Everyone is on the same page. There is no overlord in the hierarchy. There is no my way or the highway. Usually, if there is an overlord, it can create for a very toxic environment. Of course, now, the CEO, they're going to have their final say in the end, but we all get to say, we all get a say in it. You know, I have always felt like I was being heard. I have never felt like I was being shut up for whatever I had to say. You know, if what I was saying was not quite in alignment with the decision that was made, there is always an explanation that comes with it. There's a why. As long as we make sure that everyone is heard and we are open and we are honest with each other and there is no overlord, we are going to move forward with our best foot. That's why we like to think of ourselves as conversing in the meeting room on the Starship Enterprise. Let's move into open door policy. So 
We talk about this a lot at the studio, and we often refer to this as open communication. What open communication means to us is to have an open and honest line that goes both ways. Creating an environment where information and sometimes tough conversations happen with the right people that can offer or help find a solution. That means making yourself as a leader available and accessible, whether that be through Slack or through check-in, Zoom meetings, emails, uh, whatever that leader is most comfortable with, in order to listen to their team. Now, there is an ugly reputation out there in the entertainment industry where people are laid off or they're fired for, or sorry, for not, they're just laid off or fired without being given a rhyme or reason why. And it makes me wonder if the person had only knew what they, could, what they were doing wrong or, you know, where they could improve, they could have been given a chance to fix it. We are not some places. We have the expectation that when we bring you on board, you are going to fail. You're going to fail. And that's okay. It's completely okay. Learn from it. Own it. Own it like I am just telling you all these uh, crazy failure stories. Share those stories. Let people know what mistakes you've made that sculpted you into the person today. These conversations are so important to have with your team. Making them aware of a situation or a habit or a weakness or just something that was flat out said. These are moments that are going to make them into a better professional. Tackle these conversations as soon as they pop up on your radar. Doing that now will avoid conflict and building frustrations with the team if you talk to them as soon as possible. We have found that these conversations have been some of the most effective and respect-building talks that benefits everyone. And all it takes is an open and honest conversation. Now, there is the reverse line to open communication that we talk about nonstop at the studio. I'm sure those that are listening in know exactly where I'm about to go with this. Let me tell you guys, it is just never a good start to the day when you go into your email and you see there's an email in there that reads, I regret to inform you, but I'm putting in my two weeks notice. Mm. The dreaded two weeks notice. I want to share with you guys why we feel the two weeks notice just doesn't work in our industry. It takes time to get someone ramped into a project. It takes time to ramp to take someone off a project that has been there for a long time. If you are in a leadership role, it takes time to find that person, replace that replace them with replace you with that person, train them up. Let them fly. Ugh. If you are just being offered or you just committed to taking on a leadership role on a project and you decide to put in your two weeks notice, ah, it really puts things into a doozy. Two weeks notice puts stress on the project, the team, the leads, the department, especially when it comes out of the blue. Now, I am not here to stop you from leaving. We hired you for a reason. We like you. I'm going to first ask if we can't, can we keep you? Is there anything, you know, we can talk about that will make you want to stay with us? If I'm stopping you from going somewhere else, oh, guys, should have left yesterday. You know, it's completely normal and natural to want to leave a studio. I want to support your growing process. All we ask is to give us enough time to find the replacement and train them in. Be self-aware of the value that you have with your team and have those conversations with us as soon as possible. So that way we may figure out a proper exit strategy. Pull yourself back, look at the bigger picture, put yourself in the shoes of others. And no, I wanna support 
I want to support you in whatever your goals may be or where you want to go. But let's make this process as easy as possible for you and for us. There is a right way to leave a studio. That's old. There we go. For us, making sure that open communication feels present with our team and that there's a level of comfort in the fact that we aren't going to treat them any differently with us knowing this information that they want to leave us. In fact, it has done the complete opposite. It has worked wonders for the health of the studio. We consistently tell our artists to let us know if they're just even having the floating thought that they are thinking about leaving. That way, you know, we can open up this conversation about what is it that's giving them that itch for them to want to leave. If it's something that we can help with internally, hey, let's talk about that. Let's figure something out. If it's just simply that they are ready to go and explore other options, hey, we can help with that too. Remember when I said it, it's a small industry and that we have connections everywhere. We're going to help you to go wherever you want to go. We're going to help you build your demo reel. We're going to help you with that test. We're going to talk to that company. You know, send your work over to the people, the right people that that can review your work. We have done this for our artists. We have sent their demo reels out to studios that, you know, are to the people that are hiring at that studio. Because we have found that it has added a lot of value to our relationships and to who we are. Our door is open so wide for, for that person that gives us the time for us to make these calls. There's just no bridges burned in the making of this process, and it is just beautiful. So I want to share a story with, with all of you about one of our animators. And this is more of a positive one rather than a failure of one, but it really demonstrates a bit more about how we operate in this type of situation. So we had this animator come to us and tell us that they had been offered a position at their dream job. Whoa, hey, congratulations. That's awesome. We know you've always wanted to go there. Tell us more. <laughs> they said, I had already turned it down. Why you turn it? Are you mad? Why would you turn it down? Why didn't you talk to us? And they said, "Well, when I joined Steamroller, I had promised you a year, and I hold myself accountable to my word." Ugh. Okay, you are a true professional. Thank you, but let's talk about these options. We don't want you passing up opportunities like this if that is where you want to go. Ironically enough, a few months later, that same dream studio came knocking on their door again. They came immediately to us and we started talking about the options. In the end, they decided to stay with us. They were happy here, they loved their team, and they saw where we were headed for, for the future and wanted to be a part of that. We have found that the more and more of these conversations we shared with our team about people leaving studios the right way, the more and more we found that they were being more open with us. We actually now include these conversations in our welcome to steamroller with our new hires, which is a bit odd when you're like, yeah, let's talk about how you should be leaving our studio on day one. But uh, we want to keep you, but this is just how you kind of want to proceed with it. Because our goal is to take away the fear that comes along with, if I tell my manager that I want to leave, they're going to treat me differently. We know studios like that. It happens. They do exist. We do not think like that. If you give us the respect to tell us, that you want to leave well before you plan to, it is a huge plus in our books because it is giving us the ability now to plan and make better calls because we have more accurate information. Building relationships with your team is important. So are partnership relationships. Oh, God. 
We believe that relationships are everything. I want to say this again because this is very important and it applies on just so many levels. Relationships are everything. Building relationships is just as important with our partners as it is internally with our team. We treat our partners as if we are collaborating with our friends. We want to feel as if we are working with them in the next room. We don't look at our partners as if we are just any outsourced team. And we don't like to think of ourselves as just any outsourced team. You know, we... Oh, there it is sharing that mutual excitement for a project and wanting to make it the best that we can sets everyone up to head in the right direction to succeed and be proud of the work that goes into this project. When starting a new partnership, we actually like to encourage our partners to enter a testing period with us before committing to anything long-term. That way we can see if we're a good fit for them and if they are a good fit for us. It's important to, uh, you know, sorry, during this testing stage or what also can be considered the ramp up stage, it's important to go into this part of the process with an open mind and flexibility. We have, we, it's just, like, I'm stuttering all over the place now. Uh, we found that one way can work better for one project. And another way can work better for another project. And that's because, you know, going into this stage, you have to be very, very open with being flexible on changing production. That is what you're analyzing here, because that testing period is very much, it's laying the ground plane to see how everything, this partnership is going to work with production. So with that, on any given project, we assign a coordinator, animation lead, animation supervisor, and an animation director. Out of that structure, we feel that our production team is the most valuable one of them all. You know, on Anthem and Destruction All-Stars, because they are just a freaking rock star of a team, um, our production coordinators are the communication hub and so much more. They support communication with our internal team, uh, our leadership team, our external partners. They are also mapping and tracking schedule, task progression, assisting with blocking issues, and they are sending and receiving files. Since communication is so crucial, it is important to establish an open line for this to run as smoothly as possible during this period. We typically will set up a shared Slack channel, and we also establish weekly Zoom meetings with our partners. Now, email is fine, but we have found that it tends to be a little bit slower going back and forth with email and just Slack is just a glorious direct connect to making things move along a little bit tighter. So our partners, they have access to the animation director, supervisor, lead, and the production coordinator. We do not give the names out of our animators. And there is no exception to that policy. And I'd like to tell you guys that for, for two reasons. First one for poaching. It's happened before, and we just don't want that to happen again. The second reason is, is that we want to protect our animators. And this is what I mean by this. You know, we like to be the filter between our partners and our team. It is part of our leadership team's role to manage team morale. It is easier for, or sorry, it is easy for us artists to be demoralized when we we show our work and we're looking for this reaction after working so hard on this shot and we don't quite get what we're looking for. You know, it can be a bit demoralizing or maybe it's, uh, <clears throat> we got to pivot and there's a big direction change that has to happen in this shot, even though it's nicely animated. This is just a learning process that takes some artists years to understand to not become so attached to one's work. We have found that it is that this is just best to manage with our leadership team when they are the ones delivering the feedback to our internal team and painting the situation in the most positive and constructive way as possible. 
Now, going into, into every... I'm sorry. You know, this would be a good time to take a sip, yeah? All right. Now, we go into every partnership with this internal structure. Uh, there must be a point during this stage where we need to be self-aware. Recognize the mood, the feeling that is happening in these Zoom calls. And be willing to pivot if pipeline gets in the way of production. If we are feeling any hesitation from our partners in these meetings, it is time to analyze the production. What are the bottlenecks? You know, what are expectations on speed and quality? There may be a misalignment in the picture somewhere, you know, where the most frank way to make sure that you're heading down the right path during this testing process is to hop into a call as soon as possible with the leadership team and our partners. Because usually these conversations reveal that there is missing information that we may, may be discovering uh, from, that, from that call. You know, maybe it's be because of estimates or time. Maybe it's where quality efforts should really be spent. Or maybe it's misalignment on creative liberty, etc. But pivoting and changing how to approach things throughout the project, that's going to be an organic process and forever evolving. But it's important to establish as much as you can in the very beginning so we may ramp into production at full speed as quickly and efficiently as possible. If there is a mistake that happens along the way, and might I add, they definitely do happen, own up to it. I am the first person to say, yep, I dropped the ball there. I screwed up. I'm going to go work with my team. I'm going to figure it out with them, and we're going to move on. Now, there was a mistake that I used to make quite often in my earlier days of, of leading. And I want to tell you guys, because I do see a lot of this, a lot of people falling into this trap. And I want to tell you guys, do not settle. I used to do this a lot when I was given files or a rig or accepting a process that we had received for a project. I was all about working with what we were given and doing the best that we can with that. But let me tell you guys, today... I see efficiency on a much bigger scale now. And there is just so much to be gained from asking our partners, hey, you know, is there a chance that we can get a rig fix uh, on such and such? Or, hey, would you mind telling us a bit more about your process on this? Or, hey, do you guys happen to have a tool that speeds up this, this, this part a bit so we can move a bit faster? The worst that's going to happen from this conversation is, what, a no? Okay. No harm, no foul. We move on. But you know what this does? It opens the door to increase efficiency. And it shows that we care. We all want to move, move forward with as much ease on the technical side so we can focus on the creative. We are all about asking questions and making choices that better the project. So there is a guiding rule that we share a lot with our team internally, and that is to spend only 15 minutes on trying to solve a problem. And if you have found no solution for that problem, reach out to your lead. The lead is then going to either offer a solution or they're going to go talk to our partners. Now, depending upon the complexity or how blocking this issue may be, we like to jump into a Zoom call as soon as possible. Just a lot easier to communicate that way instead of typing everything out. We do not wait until the next official meeting to bring up all these issues. You don't want to walk in there and be like, this is all the stuff we're running into. No, tackle it immediately. If you need clarity on a task, if you are being blocked, do not sit and wait on it. We go and we talk to them as soon as it is brought to attention. So my next point is that Steamroller, we, we are aware that scope changes happen. It can be on a bigger scale or it can be on a shot scale, but hey, it's all part of the creative process. We're in an industry that organically grows and pivots all the time. And we have learned to be extremely adaptable to that. 
Having a discussion between our partners if something is unobtainable is important to have, especially when it comes to deadlines. We never want to miss a deadline. Woo, no, woo, mm. If a deadline is coming up and a shot has been put through the ringer or a major, dire major direction change, it's good to talk to our partners ab about the picture, about the situation, because it's going to allow us to see, one, if the deadline can be moved. Or we're going to find out, hey, this is actually where we need to spend uh, our focus, so let's put priority here. Or you know what? Maybe it's just getting clarity on, oh, it only needs to be at this certain stage, and we're going to come back and we're going to polish it later. Or the deadline can't move, which means which that's fine. Now it's up. Now it's for us to figure out internally what our options are to best avoid OT as much as possible. We do not encourage OT here. We do not like it. This is why we are always talking to our partners and painting, painting the picture. So being transparent and making both parties aware of the situation before it occurs can avoid major headache or damage to a relationship. We want to feel like we are present and we are with them in the next room. We are working together to make the vision of the project as awesome as it can be. So with that, I am clicking through my slides so I can make it here. That was my talk on embracing failure. Failure, what is that word? Fail embracing failure in animation, a topic about leadership. And I do want to leave you guys with, with this, you know, be kind to yourself. Cut yourself a little slack. Don't take yourself too seriously. Um, especially when you're taking on these leadership roles. I know that's a lot easier said than done, but, you know, you guys just see me, saw me fail a lot in this talk and you just roll with the punches. Um, allow yourself to make mistakes. Let them become who you are or part of who you are and share your stories with others. You know, just give yourself a little grace, okay? But thank you all for listening and thank you for Anam State for hosting. And hopefully we'll get to talking in the future sometime. That's it. Thank you, everyone. Oh, my goodness gracious. What an incredible talk. <laughs> I don't know if you had the Twitch chat up. There are big requests for you to have your own YouTube channel. <laughs> Where is your own Twitch stream? What an oh, incredible, guys, incredible stop. talk. Down. Thank you so much for sharing with us. Uh, you had the thank you information up there, but just quickly, where can people, what's the best way for people to reach out to you online if they have further questions or mm. after that, honestly, incredible sales pitch for working at Steamroller, where where can they apply? <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Um, guys, I, I'm i on Twitter. I, I, I do kind of respond. It looks like I'm silent on there, but you can reach me there. Um, I do accept on LinkedIn. Just let me know, hey, it's all your random state talk. So I'm like, who is this person? Um, just nice to know uh, where you, who you are. Um, but you can go to steamrollerstudios.com and there's a careers page on there if you are looking to apply um, or if you're interested in hearing more about us. And I am happy to answer emails. This is probably risky. Oh God, I don't know. Where's Jill? Jill is probably like looking at me. Amanda, don't give out your email. Um, Twitter. Just open your DMs on Twitter. Let's do, yeah, let's do let's do Twitter, and uh, that's all good. And LinkedIn, I love LinkedIn. So, well, thank uh, you yeah, so thank much, you Amanda. Asking. Incredible, incredible talk. Uh, the stream. Stick around. Up next, we have three inventories of a demo reel slash portfolio with Nate Walpole. We'll see you soon.